Hi, I'm Marina L. McClure, and I am here to help you learn to read the Bible better. Um, in this video today, we are going to do that by reading and examining closely one of the verses, maybe kind of one and a half verses, out of um, Matthew 4, a story that is often called the temptation of the Christ. So this is, we're going to do it out of Matthew. There is this story exists in parallel forms in Mark and in Luke, but we are looking at the version which is out of Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Like I said, we are going to zero in on specific verses here. If you like this kind of study, which you will see kind of what's going on here, we're going to go deep dive details. Um, stay tuned. At the end, I'm doing something I haven't done before. I am going to give you a way to access um, a free full length video. So these videos that I do on YouTube are kind of like a short mini lesson. And then I do longer lessons that cover all the verses and everything and more depth on a lot of them um, on, in an ongoing study I'm doing. There's kind of a membership study. There's a big group of us. It's go at your own pace. You can't be behind. Um, there's more to it. I'll let you check out the link when I send when I put it in the notes. But check that out at the end. I'll give you that info too. And I would just love to have you join us there in addition to subscribing and liking here. So sorry, that was a long intro. Let's jump in. Matthew 4 verse 3. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. All right. So a few things. The thing I kind of want to talk about in this verse today, this verse in particular, but also kind of this whole little story gets talked about a lot as if as one of as something that's happening here, which is one of the things that can be happening here. I don't want to make it sound like that's not right. But a lot of times what gets talked about relative to this verse is this idea of Satan coming and sort of challenging the validity of Jesus's identity. So you might remember, and it's important to remember that what happened literally right before this in the book of Matthew, for 1600 some years after this was written, there were no such thing as chapter and verse delineation. So this is just all part of the same story, just like anything else you read, a book, a article in a newspaper, a text, you name it, what comes in what order, makes is important. So this is just like that. So what comes right before this is that Jesus goes with some intention, the Greek tells us, to be baptized by John the Baptist. And he tells him, we've got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. They do it. And then immediately this heavenly voice comes and says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And then the spirit descends on him in the form of a dove. So although there is not, you know, perfect clarity about exactly technically what's happening in this moment. It is no doubt that it is a huge moment. And then we move into this next thing where the next thing that happens is Jesus gets tempted and Satan's first challenge to him is this. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So appropriately, this is what a lot of people talk about. He's saying, well, if you are, then prove it. Essentially, I think is how a lot of times it gets looked at and discussed, especially because it does come on the heels of God's pronouncement where he authorizes and affirms Jesus's identity. However, one really cool and interesting thing about this verse is the way that the Greek gets translated into English has some ambiguity about it. So there are a number of scholars, Craig Blomberg is one of them, but there's quite a few who talk about in their writing about this passage, that this word that is often translated as if in this part, if you are the son of God, might be better translated as since, since you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Well, that kind of changes the tone, doesn't it? So whereas if we go with the path of if, we can understand, right? That it's saying, well, are you who you really say you are? Are you really the son or who he says you are? Are you really the son of God? Prove it. But if the tone is actually, well, since you're the son of God, show me what you got. That's a totally different potential challenge in there. So he could be saying, well, if you are, since you're the son of God, like, show me your stuff. What's it look like to be the son of God? He could be saying more like, okay, since you're the son of God, do all the son of God stuff that we expect you to do. Or as a lot of people kind of use this language around it of like, okay, if you're, since you're the son of God, show us what kind of son of God you are going to be. That is probably a good lens through which to look at the larger story here. Uh, but in this particular spot, it's really interesting to consider that instead of 
challenging the validity of who Jesus is. He is challenging how Jesus will be who he is. I will say this could be both and. This does not have to be, oh, it's only this or it's only that. This is part of the, you know, mystery and joy of working with 2000 year old text in a different and us studying in a different language altogether. Again, this isn't coming out of my own brain. This is scholars who are many are saying, you know, this should probably be since you are the son of God. And in that case, that really does change the tone here. Uh, Another interesting thing to consider in that same vein is a question that is often what is discussed um, around this whole section is, you know, how is this a temptation for Jesus? So if we think about this a little bit from Jesus's perspective, that can be super interesting. It is so normal and typical to read this passage from the eyes of a Christian 2000 some years later who kind of knows the end of the story, right? Like I already know where we're going with this. I'm very clear on who Jesus is. Most likely I'm not even reading this if I'm not convinced about who Jesus is and I know how he does it. I know what the end story looks like. However, there is room to have a conversation about what does Jesus know at this point? Um, And what does Satan know at this point? That's another angle that can be really interesting just to consider. You know, it's easy to sort of run down this path thinking, um, oh, well, that's obvious. Like, clearly Jesus is Jesus. Like, he just knows stuff. Sure, maybe. Also, there's some places where that doesn't fully check out if you just take it in a flat, like, that's the end of the sentence, full stop. So what I think is really cool for us to just think about here is, you know, what is it going to look like for him? And does he know what it's going to look like? Is this a reflection of him as God? Probably somewhat, but he is also a man. I think we often have a difficulty holding together those two things fully, 100% man, 100% God. I will talk about that more in another video. Um, But really what we're looking at here is that instead of a potentially, instead of a challenge to the validity of his authority is a challenge to the nature of his authority. What's it going to be like for you? How are you going to do this, Jesus? Um, There were other people right around this same time, maybe not like this exact year, but in the 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years before and after Jesus, 100 years after, well, really 1600 years after Jesus, there were people who had large followings that were believed by those people and by themselves to be the Messiah. So the Jewish notion of Messiah at this point in time um, versus the Christian notion of Messiah today are just different. And so what we need to remember is that it's not a given. It could be, it could be, Uh, but there is, it's not a given that at this moment in his own story, one, Jesus totally understood what the future held for him or what his real role and identity were. Um, A lot of scholars think that that heavenly voice, you know, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, or you are my son in whom I am well pleased, depending on which gospel you read, that only Jesus could hear it. Well, if Jesus already knew that, what's the point of the voice? a lot of interesting things to look at there. Many of us have not been exposed to that idea. I mean, I definitely grew up not even, it never occurred to me that Jesus did not know from the first minute he was born exactly who he was, all of what was going to be required of him, exactly what it would look like. And he apparently, I thought he had a pretty fully formed theological understanding of himself, you know, like the day he was born. Uh, The more I have learned and the more I learn, the more unlikely that seems to me. And this is one of the places where that can become more illuminated and can also be really interesting to look at. So here he's being asked, like, if you're the son of God, or since you are, command these stones to be loaves of bread. Well, if there's no temptation there for him, then what is the point of this moment? Um, Also, like Craig Keener points out, he's really being asked to do something that in the day was would have been thought of as magic. And magic had a very clear spot sort of in the psyche at the time that it was understood as sort of usurping or um, manipulating divine uh, prerogative, like it's interrupting what divinity was doing. And in the Greco-Roman culture, which was 
you know, knocking on the door of Judaism all in the hundreds of years leading up to this moment and all around it, um, you know, deities were the ones who did transform. Go read any Greek mythology and you will see the gods taking different shapes and assigning things to new shapes all the time. So here, there's also a little bit of a thread potentially there of like, are you going to look like that? Also, is it a place where he's delineating himself from those other Messiah figures? Maybe. Okay, sorry. I just had a major coughing fit. So edited that out. So anyway, these are some of the thoughts to consider around this. Just that one little word is it if or since can spin a whole bunch of things to look at them in a brand new way. So as promised at the beginning, check out the link. It is going to be Marina L. McClure backslash preview. Pretty simple. If you know the name of the channel, which you can see anywhere on your screen right now, then you can find it pretty easily and I'll put it in the notes. So it'll be even easier. Would love to have you check that out. Watch the full length video. Check out the info on the website about the study. I'd love to have you join us. And any thoughts, questions you have here today, um, I'd love to hear them. This was kind of a lot to try to fit into one little video. Um, so let me know what your thoughts are, where the questions exist, what's provoked for you, and check out the preview. I'd love, love, love to have you join us. Thanks. Bye-bye.